Welcome back to the spoilers for The Stanley Principle. Yeah, we're gonna be spoiling the epilogue, so, you know, go play the game, then come back, okay? Today I'd like to talk about positioning the audience relative to the subject of a scene. Now, if you've ever done any cinematography, you already know how important this is. How close is the camera? How high? How low? It's not the only factor, obviously, but it is an important one. If you have a long fight sequence and you film it from far away, then the audience will think, oh, look at our indomitable little guy, tenacious, holding up against the, the hordes. If you film it up close and they can see every gunshot and every knife wound, they're going to go, oh my god, this is super violent. Range matters a lot. Here's the thing, though. It's not limited to cinematography, it's not limited to visual narratives. Any narrative has this component in it. How close is the audience to various parts of the narrative? The subjects of the narrative. This is something we can learn by looking at the Stanley Parable because, uh, yeah, they use this a lot and they're constantly tweaking it. It's really great. Let's start. The most obvious one, of course, the narrator himself. The narrator uh, is basically constantly in our heads, except for on the takes where he doesn't actually say anything in the first room. He, uh, he is going to loom large in how we interpret the narrative because essentially we're always up his nose. If the narrative was shown from a visual perspective, there would be a close shot of his nose hair constantly, 24-7. This doesn't mean that he's always exactly that far away from us, though. For example, we can pick up a bucket. It's bucket time. This allows the narrator to uh, have another layer of remove. They can now talk to the bucket through Stanley, or they can talk through the bucket. The door on his they can address the bucket. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, but Stanley had felt the bucket calling to him telling him that the employee lounge was simply the place to be. You can see that he can blame things on the bucket. This creates enough distance between us and the narrator that we can start to flex a little bit with exactly what kinds of, of shots we can use, what we can start to think about the narrator, because now the narrator has enough distance from us that he can start to say things he wouldn't normally say, and we can see angles, sides of him that we normally wouldn't be able to see. But there's another, more subtle technique that's already in use. All of his co-workers were gone. What could it mean? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. Did you see it? Stanley decided to go to the meeting room? That's right, Stanley himself is part of this distancing technique. Stanley is something that the narrator can choose to address or choose to ignore. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. And you'll find that the narrator constantly changes his distance from us by either interposing or removing Stanley. Yet there was not a single person here either. Feeling a wave of disbelief, Stanley decided to go up to his boss's office, hoping he might find an answer there. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 not again. I won't be part of this. I'm not going to encourage you. I'm not going to say anything at all. I'm just going to be patient and wait for you to finish whatever it is you enjoy doing so much in this room. Please take your time. Now, if you've watched through the rest of the videos, you already know that if you stand here, the narrator gets steadily more and more upset. And as he does, he stops talking about what Stanley is doing, and he starts talking about what the player is doing, to the point where he will literally start addressing you as the player and then kill you off and replace you with player two. Obviously this changes the distance between us and the narrator. He stops interposing Stanley and starts talking about the player directly. So I think that this is a really important example of how you can fairly subtly control exactly how far the player is from a given subject, in this case, the narrator. But it's far from the only thing uh, that this game does to control the distance. So I'm going to just pause for a second. Be right back. Perhaps his death was of no great loss, like plucking the eyeballs from a blind man. And so he resigned and willingly accepted this violent end to his brief and shallow life. 
Farewell, Stanley. Farewell, Stanley, cried the narrator, as Stanley was led helplessly into the enormous metal jaws. So there you can see another example of how they control the range of the narrative. We've been stuck up the narrator's nose this whole time, and then suddenly, all of reality pauses, and the narrator is encapsulated into being the narration of another character. This radically changes what we think of the narrative and where we are relative to it. We're now outside of it and looking down onto it. Now, obviously, this is a comedy game, which is why they play so fast and loose with this kind of technique, but this same basic sort of thing can apply in any narrative. When you zoom out, when you move away, when you change perspectives, that can be a very powerful way to recontextualize everything that a game is about or a narrative is about. There are still a lot of narrative techniques at play here, um, but one of the most important ones is one that I've sort of um, brushed under the rug a little bit, and that's the fact that this is a comedy game. I mean, I've mentioned it, but I don't think I've really gone into detail about how pervasive the fact that it's a comedy game is. No matter what other con context you're in, no matter what's going on in the game world or what narrative beat is happening, you are always conscious of the fact that this is a comedy. And that allows them to do things that normally might not be such a good idea because it introduces a very specific angle on every single narrative beat. Things that in a serious game would be wrong or missed would be okay in a comedy game because, oh look, they're just trying so hard as a joke. A really good example of that would be the epilogue. You ready? So the epilogue is a series of short vignettes as we're trying to cross the desert. And each vignette gets a little bit more artsy-fartsy. Now, in most games, these artsy-fartsy vignettes would be a little bit dicey because they feel like they're trying pretty hard. And, uh, you know, if you miss after trying pretty hard, it can be a real shock to the player's system. It can feel, you know, oh, look, they're being so artsy, they're being so fartsy. But because this is a comedy game, Crows, 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 that's the devs. They can try and be as fartsy and artsy as they want. They can try and make as much beauty as they want. They can reach for the stars because it's okay if they look goofy. It's okay if they trip and fall. It's okay if we laugh at them. Because it's a comedy game. Isn't this a good joke with all the moving synth music and all the beautiful shots and uh, all of the perfect timing? Yeah, yeah, it's such a good joke. Well, the thing is, Crows, Crows, Crows is clearly capable of creating astonishingly beautiful things. And if you haven't played this game before, there's going to be a lot of stuff here that you don't understand because most of this is references. But in terms of just the flat, flat out uh, quality of these scenes, these would be scenes that would be very nice in a serious game, but a serious game would hesitate to try this hard. And the reason for that is because a serious game 
needs to be taken seriously. If they try hard and someone laughs at them for trying too hard, well, they're SOL. But the narrative in this game is a comedy narrative and the player is always going to be implicitly positioned to view things as a comedy. And therefore, there is never going to be any opportunity for us to think, oh my gosh, those guys are so silly for trying too hard. What a failure. No, if we laugh at them, they'll just say that's the point. Jim. This is an incredibly powerful tool. It's not about necessarily creating just raw distance. It's also about creating the perspective, the context that you might need to make your game uh, feel right. And in this case, they've taken the fact that they're a comedy game and they've said, well, I mean, the fact that we're a comedy game allows us to do whatever we want. We can make things as beautiful as we want, and that's fine. Because if they laugh at us for trying too hard, for creating treacle, that's part of the experience. That's part of the joke, right? So, I thought I would show it to you. There are so many techniques you can use to make your game's narratives flow better. And a big part of that is going to be controlling exactly what the audience thinks of your narrative. And a chunk of that is exactly where they are relative to it. Okay? That's all I wanted to say. Let me know what your opinion is down below.